Hi, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. And if others just continue to join, that's great. But um, I want to welcome everyone to Let's Talk About Prevention. My name is Stacey Pendarvis. I am the Vice President of Programs at the Monique Burr Foundation for Children, also known as MBF. Um, I've been with MBF for nine years. And if you don't really know about our organization, I really encourage you to look at our website and learn more about us. We're a small but mighty team. Um, since 2010, we have reached over three and a half million students and children across the US and in three other countries with our prevention education programs. And I'm going to tell you just quickly a little bit about those. Um, we, our sole focus is child focused prevention education. And we have school based programs and extracurricular programs that cover bullying, cyberbullying, all four types of child abuse, digital safety, um, exploitation, trafficking, and more. Our programs are very comprehensive based on poly victimization research. Our elementary school program, MBF Child Safety Matters, um, is the first evidence-based comprehensive curriculum in the country. So we're really proud of that. Um, so how did we get here today? You know, I believe, and I'm sure that you guys um, probably experienced the same thing we did along with COVID. Um, we lost many opportunities to attend conferences and learning opportunities this, this year, this past year so far. And so we wanted to um, bring learning opportunities to you in the comfort of your home or your office at no cost. And we're very fortunate to have a lot of great partners um, that we collaborate with. And so we were able to compile this amazing series that we're gonna share with you. And we're super excited that so many of you have joined us. Um, most of our sessions are going to be, well, all of our sessions are gonna be live sessions with interactive opportunities for you to ask questions um, of the presenters. But today with Erin, um, we're starting with her because we felt like her story was really compelling and powerful, but she was unable to be with us live at this time. So we have a video about Erin that we're gonna share, and we've also done a pre-recorded interview. Um, to learn more about her story, her personal story and the work that she's doing. And then at the conclusion of that interview, we're going to share um, another video of a news story that really highlights the importance of prevention in schools. So I do want to let you know ahead of time that video is not um, perfect technology wise. Um, as I'm sure many of you can relate to working from home and Zoom having become our new best friend. Um, you know, you can have issues. So I just want to warn you about that ahead of time. Um, so to start, let me tell you a little bit about Erin. Erin Marin is an internationally recognized author, speaker, and child abuse advocate and activist. For six years of her childhood, she was sexually abused, keeping her secret locked away in her childhood diary. Before graduating from high school, Erin published her diary into a book called Stolen Innocence. She has since published three additional books. She earned a BSW from Western Illinois University and an MSW from Aurora University. In 2013, she had Erin's law passed in her home state of Illinois, a law that requires personal body safety be taught in schools every year. She has made it her mission to have it passed in all 50 states. Since 2004, Erin has shared her story in over 200 publications and has appeared on Oprah, Today, Good Morning America, CNN, TLC, and Fox, among others. Glamour Magazine named her one of, uh, I'm sorry, Glamour Magazine named her Woman of the Year in 2012, and People Magazine named her one of 15 women changing the world in 2014. Erin lives in Chicago, Illinois, where she is married and the mother of three girls. And as you'll see in the upcoming video, Erin is being interviewed by Clark Foraker, who is a host and storyteller for NBC LX, a new national network launched by NBC focused on contextual storytelling targeting millennials. At LX, Clark reports on data privacy in the era of big tech, wage and sustainability initiatives in the global fashion industry and companies prioritizing social good over profits. He is the recipient of an Alfred I. DuPont Award, a National Murrow Award, and two Emmy Awards. 
He earned a bachelor's degree in telecommunication and news from the University of Florida and a master's degree in business journalism from Columbia University. And Clark just happens to also be the son of our president and CEO, Lynn Layton. Since Erin isn't with us live today, you won't have the opportunity to ask her questions. However, we will give you her contact information at the end of the webinar, so you can reach out directly to her if you'd like. If you have any other questions that you would like me to answer at the end of the webinar, just type them in the Q&A box. Um, our outreach manager, Beth Dujak, is monitoring that and she'll join us at the end to, to see um, what questions you might have and if we can answer those. So let's get started. I came from a family of three girls and I felt like I had the perfect life. I was the happiest little five and six year old and had so much fun as a child. I struggled for years in my childhood with watching my family suffer. It, um, it tore our family apart. I went down the path of self injury, a suicide attempt, very depressed. This could be happening to your child. This can be happening to your next door neighbor, your best friend you've known your entire childhood. And you had no idea because of the shame that people carry. When I was a kindergartner, um, I had been asked by my best friend Ashley and we to spend the night. And I was excited, that little kid going off to my first sleepover. And after watching a Little Mermaid, we went to her room to go to sleep. She climbed up in her bed and me on the ground in my little sleeping bag, fell asleep. And eventually I woke up to the bedroom door opening and looked over there and there her uncle was. I thought he was checking to make sure we were asleep. And instead he closed the door, came down to where I was on the ground, told me to be quiet. And I did, I stayed quiet. He sexually abused me and told me this is our little secret. No one will believe you. I know where you live, Aaron. I'll come get you. I think he promised my best friend I would never tell anybody what her uncle was doing. What is your name? Aaron. And then how old are you? Eight. My abuse ended when I was eight and a half and we moved. Suddenly I'm going to a new school, making new friends. Little did I realize by moving was getting me that much closer to the next perpetrator in my life. This time, it was my cousin, Brian wake up to him sexually abusing me. And for the next almost two years, he repeatedly tells me, this is our secret. No one will believe you. You have no proof that I did this. And I believed it. I believed him that no one would believe me. So I stayed silent because my only education came from these perpetrators. At 13 years old, my 11 year old sister came to me with the same secret. My little sister blurted out the words, Brian's gross. And I knew instantly what that meant and was just filled with anger and rage. So we broke our silence, our abuse ended, we claimed our voice, and that was the first step in moving forward and healing our lives. Because I had my parents' support and believing my sister and I, I wanted other people to realize that there is support for them out there as well. Looking back on my childhood, I learned tornado drills, bus drills, fire drills. Yet there was nothing on how to speak up and tell if you're being abused. So I created Aaron's Law in my home state of Illinois. Oh, this is my Back in 2010, I was working my full-time master's level job as a counselor working with youth. I quit my job, tried to figure out a way of how I was gonna explain to people that, you know, I'm gonna speak about educating kids on the prevention of abuse, because my own state lawmaker said, Aaron, we don't talk about that in society. They will never teach this in school. And I made it my mission not just to get this passed in Illinois, but I made it a mission to travel to all 50 states, testifying to lawmakers on the importance on this. And I tell these lawmakers, I'm not going away. This is something that everyone should stand behind. 
Arizona law requires every year child sexual abuse to be taught in public schools. So once a year, students must be informed on personal body safety, on how to speak up and tell the differences between safe and unsafe touch, safe and unsafe secrets, and give kids these voice and educate our educators on warning signs to look for. You know, how to properly handle when a child discloses abuse. And there are multiple stories as a result of Aaron's law being passed. We need to end the stigma and shame around this subject. Legislators, parents, teachers, they need to wake up and realize that this is going on. You all know somebody that this has happened to. I really want parents to see the importance behind this. And I want kids to reclaim their voice and be able to break their silence and end their suffering. That is my mission in life. if this takes me a lifetime and you know I'm doing this at 90 years old this is you know my calling in life and I'm going to be fighting for this until the end Aaron thank you so much for uh, joining us for this webinar uh, we just watched your powerful video about your story and you mentioned at one point in there that in school, like many of us, you had fire drills, tornado drills, all of the kid training you would get in school, but you never had sexual abuse training. And I wonder if you would just tell us about that and how you think it would have changed your experience if you had had it. Yeah, I wasn't taught those things. And like you mentioned, we got the tornado drills, the bus drills. Now we do internet safety, bowling intervention. And it was really emphasized when I was a kid, stranger danger police officer came in every year and taught us, you know, not to look for the lost puppy, not to take candy from the stranger. Um, but no one was educating me on personal body safety, on, you know, safe and unsafe touch, safe and unsafe secrets. If someone is sexually abusing you, you tell someone. And I am almost positive, had that police officer that had been teaching us about strangers every year, had showed us a video or did some type of dialogue with us on personal body safety that, I would have been able to recognize what this person was doing was wrong instead of listening to the only education I got, and that was to keep it a secret. Don't tell anyone. I know where you live. I'll come get you. That was the only education I was getting, you know, was threats. Um, and so I think if someone had come in and taught me this, um, my abuse would have ended a lot sooner than six and a half years of my childhood. You've developed and pioneered Aaron's Law and are now working to get that law passed across the country. Can you tell us a little bit more about Aaron's Law and what you're asking communities and states and schools to do as a part of it? Yes, so 10 years ago, I had this vision. Looking back at my childhood, it was the one thing that wasn't taught. So I decided, what could I do to start getting schools to teach the message I wish I would have gotten? Um, because we can't rely on parents to talk to kids about this, because so often the conversation with them ends with talking to the kids about strangers. They don't think the person that they love and trust with their kids would harm them. So they don't have that conversation. So I decided to start reaching out to lawmakers in my state of Illinois, asking them to require once a year that we teach kids personal body safety education. Teaching kids the differences between safe and unsafe touch, how to speak up and tell if you're being sexually abused, that this is not your fault. You know, you will be believed because that is something children that are being abused are repeatedly told you won't be believed um, in, in enforcing that with kids and getting them to recognize that, you know, this isn't your fault. Um, and, you know, the grooming behaviors um, of what predators do with kids before the abuse actually begins. And so I began reaching out to my state lawmakers, asking them to, you know, pass this and, you know, made it my mission 10 years ago to get this law passed in all 50 states. Because as I say, it's what would have I believed saved me in my childhood. And it's my hope that I can save other kids from experiencing abuse. In sixth grade, I went through the D.A.R.E. program. Graduate is a little D.A.R.E. graduate. And when you graduated, you learned the eight ways to say no to drugs. 
But I stand here today and ask you, where were the eight ways on how to get away and how to tell today? I decided to put that shame, the stigma, and be a voice for those who are too afraid to come forward. The voice for those of people you yourself know that have yet to speak up about this horrific crime that goes in day in, day out, that is going on right now in our own backyards, in our own communities. I decided to go after this law because we need to educate and empower kids through age appropriate curriculum, research based, that will give kids the tools and knowledge on how to tell and keep their perpetrators from abusing them ever again, from abusing more children. For example, the Sandusky case. So many children could have been saved in that situation. We cannot leave this up to all the adults. Look at how many adults there from a coach, a president of a university, that continue to allow this to go on for 10 more years. Seeing this man around children 10 years after it was reported. I wish we can just leave it up to the adults. But we can't because we have adults that do not do the right thing. That's why we need to empower kids with their voice to tell, 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 and to continue to tell until it stops. And in the end, the kids end up being the heroes because they're saving another child's life from becoming the next victim from this evil, silent epidemic. And so as of uh, today, how many states have passed Aaron's law? So as of today, we have 37 states um, that have passed it. I've got 13 left. And some of you know the biggest obstacles I had at the beginning was it was an unfunded mandate. Um, people say this is a great idea. Um, legislators say, Aaron, but there's no funding behind this. But in 2015, um, President Obama passed part of legislation in the Every Student Succeeds Act that helps federally fund Aaron's Law. Um, so that really made huge waves in getting this law passed in so many more states. Um, once I was able to provide legislators and say, hey, look, um, we've got funding now that schools can tap into through the State Board of Education to teach this. And so that's um, pretty much has helped move it forward um, in several more states quicker since then. So over 10 years, 37 states, I'm sure you've learned a lot about what it takes to get a law passed and that not all states are created equal. And so uh, tell us about that. Not all states are the same. And so uh, if states aren't uh, passing Aaron's Law and, and aren't kind of joining your cause, what are they doing? Which states are the strongest and which are the weakest and why? Yeah, um, I would say that, you know, after doing this for 10 years, you get to learn the ins and outs of what goes on at state capitals and, you know, what people are to support, what people aren't going to support. And I kind of go into it knowing now, having done this so long, of the backlash I'll, I'll see when I, you know, go to these legislators and the people that will show up and testify against it, you know, such as this is a conversation that should be left um, with parents in, in the home and not in the schools. But as I point out when I testify to legislators, um, Lots of parents aren't talking to their kids. And where's the next best place that children spend most of their time that is safe for them? It's in schools. It's those people that they see around the clock um, that can provide that support and that education for you know, children to get. And so as they traveled state to state, um, it's a bipartisan issue. Um, so as I, you know, you get people on both sides of the table supporting it, introducing the legislation. Um, I've had more pushback, though, in some of the um, conservative states because there's people jump to this conclusion when they hear the word sexual abuse and we're teaching our first graders about sex, birds and the bees, all that. And so I often have to tell legislators you have to script this language of the bill to say personal body safety, to explain it to them because as I've learned over the years, half the time these legislators don't they, you know, read the first few sentences of what a bill is and just you know, abruptly stand up and vote against this, saying we think we're teaching sex ed. And I'm like, did you read the language of the bill? This has nothing to do with that. So I have noticed that in some of the more conservative states um, having a harder time there. One of the states that I believe personally has passed one of the best laws, versions of Aaron's law, is the state of Oregon. 
um, because the state of Oregon has um, passed it where it is actually taught four times throughout the school year. And it's tough enough just to get it passed once a year in the schools. So the fact that Oregon passed it where they're teaching us four times a year, um, 30 minute lessons, but being able to bring this into the school and reinforce this message with kids, um, you know, repeatedly rather than just one time is powerful. Um, and so I think that's, that's you know, very important across, across the states, um, something that I wish more would do. And I also um, really like the version of Indiana's Aaron's Law um, because of the um, evidence-based um, requirement it has in the language of the bill. There are, there are law, um, states that have passed Aaron's Law where it says, you know, very brief, must be taught once a year, doesn't even have research-based, evidence-based, which obviously is better than nothing, but I would rather have those words in the language that say research-based, evidence-based, you know, because you want to make sure the right people are teaching us. You know, you're, we just don't want to throw this on teachers who, you know, haven't been trained on this to start talking to their first graders about it. That can do more harm than good. So I like the states such as Indiana, such as Oregon, that have written more detailed um, versions of the bill. Um, and I'm seeing South Carolina is another one of those states, and I'm seeing the success of that. Those are some of the states where you're seeing these news stories come out of, you know, because the child got two or three lessons. You know, maybe they were a little afraid at first when they had that first lesson taught on this. But all of a sudden they got a second 30-minute lesson and it gave the empowerment to go report it rather than maybe they didn't tell the first time. So I think it's, you know, I think it's important what, you know, states like those are doing where you're seeing suddenly now hitting the news, these disclosures as a result of this law being taught in schools. Erin, what does the baseline language of Aaron's law say when you initially pass it to lawmakers? And I'm curious about that because I wonder what it took in Oregon and Indiana to get those positive amendments for more stringent mm -hmm. requirements. What, what, what did you say to those lawmakers that encouraged them to kind of up the ante on this whole thing? Well, I basically point out to them giving them the versions of what was done before. And when I started doing this, the more over time, over the years of getting it passed, at first I just had to get started off in those first few states of just getting it taught. Just getting that two word, two sentences in language saying, every year K to 12th grade must be taught personal body safety education. And it's written into the education code. Once I was able to build up and get more states passing it, and being able to go to legislators in other states and say, hey, look, we've got 15 states teaching this. You know, this is what your state should do, but it should include requiring that all the teachers get trained every year. Not just mandated reporters, but how to properly you know, recognize abuse, you know, just when children disclose abuse, the proper ways of handling it, because so many do not handle it the correct way. And so I've been able over the years, of course, to come to these new legislators and say, do this, this, and this. If you can add, you know, you know, all of this. And some states come to me and say, Aaron, we're not going to be able to get all these things, you know, into this bill, like human trafficking and this and that. Or also get other states saying, you know, well, they, they'll agree to do, you know, sexual abuse prevention, but they want amendment in your bill that says bullying intervention also must be taught. I'm like, go right ahead, package it all together. You know, do the different lesson plans that, you know, talking about physical abuse, talking about sexual abuse. What you, you started to talk about earlier, one of the critiques you often get or some pushback from lawmakers that has to do with them believing that school is not the place for this type of content to be taught. Can you unpack how those conversations unfold and tell us a little bit more about what you say and what evidence you present to encourage those lawmakers that it is a good place for this conversation to be happening on a regular basis? Well, I point out to legislators when they, you know, do come to me with that, that, you know, with the one in three girls, one in six boys that are being sexually abused before the age of 18, most of them are being abused in the home. Um, you know, so that mom, that dad are not going to be talking to their kids about this. They're going to be, they're being threatened in the home. So they're not going to get that education. Or it's the other family member, the grandfather, the cousin, the uncle that is doing this. 
And there's, of course, this person they're constantly seeing that is putting this fear in them. And so I point out to these you know, legislators, when you're in this environment at home and you've got this abuser or this abuser you see frequently, you know, you can't expect kids to be taught this. And the other thing is, is kids are often, you know, afraid that they're going to hurt mom and dad that by coming forward and, you know, sharing that this has happened, that they're somehow, like I said, not going to be believed or they're going to be in trouble. That's something a lot of kids feel is they're going to be in trouble. This is somehow their fault, blaming themselves that this has happened, that they have somehow caused this. Um, and so I point out to these legislators saying, if these kids that are, you know, in these homes, there's so many broken homes out there that are not the safe environment, you know, where's the next best place where kids are safe? And it is in, as I said, the schools, the teachers, the social workers, the principal, there's, there's those connections and relationships there that kids have where kids, you know, feel safe because so many kids are from broken homes that, you know, mom and dad are not living together, dad's the abuser, the kid goes there on the weekends, or dad is a wonderful role model, but mom's got a new boyfriend and, you know, the boyfriend is abusing the child. And so they're stuck in this environment where it's not safe. They fear mom's not going to believe that boyfriend would do this or husband would do this. And sadly, I hear it so often of survivors coming to me and saying, I told my mom. And you know what she said? She said, don't ever tell anyone again. You'll be put in foster care. We'll be cut out in the streets and be homeless because the perpetrator was dad. Mom wants to protect the breadwinner of the family. She's looking at the financial aspect rather than protecting her own kids. And I know that's a hard one to swallow, but I hear it all the time. Parents not wanting to believe their own children that the spouse abused the kid. It's a sad, sad reality. So schools, as I say, is the next best place for kids to be taught this. So you get Aaron's law passed in a state, and then obviously what happens next is that uh, the law has to be uh, complied with. And so there's uh, you, someone has to fulfill the requirements that are now in the law. So can you talk about partnering with programs that teach the requirements that Aaron's Law lays out and, and what you look for in partners that fulfill those requirements and teach the things that you believe in the law requires to be taught in schools? Yeah, well, I want you know the curriculum to be age appropriate. Um, and research-based. You know, I don't want what we're teaching our first graders to be something we're teaching our sixth graders. You know, as I say, it's got to be the age-appropriate um, level for kids. And researched, evidence-based, I can't tell you how many times people have come to me with programs or even books wanting me to promote it and put it out there. And it's one of the hardest things I have to do with the work, the activism that I'm doing on this, is to tell people hey, you have good intentions, but you're using the wrong language on how to teach kids this. You're, you have, you're not a research-based program because I will only support programs that are research-based or evidence-based um, because you, know, you want that back there because it can do more harm than good by having you know, some program like in the 80s called the Good Touch, Bad Touch um, that uses the wrong language. So... I, I look for those things that are, you know, important. And also another thing that I look for is, you know, seeing how often it is taught. There's this great program out there, but they come in every other year for an hour and a half. Well, obviously we're not reaching that target of every single year. And an hour and a half with a kindergartner, that's a long time to keep their attention span. So it's better to break it up um, and, that's exactly what Child Safety Matters does. And it's, I love the fact that, you know, you've got the, what they're doing with the kindergartners and first graders, you know, is, is the shorter lessons that are two sessions. And it gets a little longer as the kids get older and you can hold their attention spans longer. Okay, so Aaron, you are discussing Aaron's Law on this podcast, which is hosted by the Moaning Bird Foundation for Children, and you've recommended that program on your website after reviewing it. Can you tell me a little bit about why you decided to um, recommend that program on your website? I decided to recommend it because after reviewing it, um, it you know obviously had the evidence um, research base that I was looking for. That's the first thing I look for in any program that is brought to my attention. I like the fact that it was more than one session with kids, as I mentioned earlier. 
you know, it reinforces this idea because some kids might not disclose that first time they're being taught it. So it's, you know, the reinforcement and, and the fact that, as I mentioned, the, you know, the time limit, what they do with the younger kids versus the older children, you know, and, and how the language, you know, the, the program is laid out for each grade level, um, I find as being excellent. And, and then you've got one of the top researchers in the country, Dr. Finkelhorn, you know, endorsing it, supporting it. I've talked to him about it. And so, you know, to hear that, you know, he sees the importance behind this. Um, and I highly look up to um, him, him as an individual and what he has done. And the other thing I love that their, pro you know, what their program does is, as I mentioned earlier, yes, I wish all parents could talk to their kids about this, but they don't. So we have to bring in the lessons to the school. But what their program, um, Child Safety Matters does, is it does the whole follow-up with parents, getting the parents engaged, sending the letter home saying, this is what your child was taught today. This is how you can follow up and asking those kids, and you know, it gives a whole outline to the parents of you know what they were taught and what questions to ask your kids to keep that dialogue going because we want the parents to be a part of this discussion and talking to their kids. I don't want to just put this on educators. Um, let's bring our conversation full circle. We saw a little video about Aaron's Law and a little bit about you at the beginning of this. You seem to be doing well now and obviously doing a very, very important work. So could you just update us on your life and your family and where uh, you see Aaron's Law going in, in the coming years? You, you've had 37 states done, but obviously there's 50. And so you, I imagine you're feeling like you've got uh, more work to do. <laughs> yes, and as yeah, and, and now that I've had 30 states, what I'm realizing is you know, I was told by my own state senator when I was trying to get it passed in one state, Aaron, you know, I agree with you. We need to teach kids personal body safety education, but you will never get this passed. You're talking about sexual abuse. We'll never teach this in school. And I went and found a different legislator and said, you know, it's your attitude that needs to change. This is why society is the way it is. And since then, now that we have 37 states that have passed it, these last 13, I've been fighting for years. Year after year after year, that bill has died. In some of these states, the bill hasn't even made it past besides being drafted and even gotten hurt. I've got the legislator saying, hey, I'm introducing it, but it doesn't go further than that. And so I know you think, you know, with, with me being so close to those final 13, but it's those final 13 that is going to take a lot more effort and push. You know, I like to threaten some of these legislators by saying, you really don't want to be that 50th state. That'll make you guys look really bad when it comes to protecting kids, where your priorities are. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, my, as I said, my push is to get this passed. My, my goal for 2020 was to get to 40 states, but COVID kind of ruined that plan. Um, cross my fingers, I can get maybe one, possibly two, um, but with, you know, not being able to go testify in these states and the bill is getting heard. Um, but I really want to get to that, that town to 10, 40 states and having that countdown that I have 10 states left to go. Um, and I, and I know it'll happen. I don't know what the time frame is going to be. It can take, you know, five years just to get those last five, you know, states. Um, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like, but, you know, my, my goal and my mission is to continue this. And, you know, once I reach all 50 states is, you know, this is not just happening in America. This is happening around the world. And so my goal is to take it international. I'm already having those conversations with people in India, with people in Sweden, with people in Canada. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if this gets passed in another country before it passes in the last three states. Um, because of the way some of these legislators, you know, live in this bubble and think that, you know, this doesn't happen, that we shouldn't teach this. But yeah, I am, um, I'm definitely pushing forward to, you know, get this done. And now as a mother to three little girls, um, you know, to finally, after doing this for 10 years, to suddenly this past year, my youngest is a kindergartner. She just finished kindergarten to get that letter home. All of a sudden, her coming home with a letter saying, your children will be taught next week, Aaron's Law, this is what Aaron's Law is. And it was just like, wow, it came full circle to suddenly after doing this for 10 years to now get this letter. And then the next week, my five-year-old has the school social worker come in and teach Aaron's Law. 
And in the middle of teaching it, my daughter, who obviously, unlike maybe all the other kindergartners, knows what Aaron's law is, knows about personal body safety education. She interrupted the school social worker and said, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about Aaron's law. That's my mom. <laughs> the social worker told me all about it. And so did she. Mom, I told the social worker that they were teaching your law. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so great. What can people do in those 13 states to help get Aaron's law on the table and in front of legislators? And I, I imagine that when schools are already partnering with programs like the Child Safety Matters program and lawmakers get a sense that there's an appetite for this type of evidence-based education in their communities, that it helps um, you know, grease the wheels for something like Aaron's Law to be passed? What I tell people is to write, not just the legislators, right there in your district. If this is not passed in your state, write every single one of them. I learned that early on. I was only contacting the ones in my district. I was only contacting the ones on the education committee. When the reality is, anyone can introduce an education bill. Um, it eventually is gonna be heard in the education committee, but anyone can introduce it. So you're gonna have a much better, more success if you you know, contact all of them. And what I often tell people is if you've experienced this and you're a survivor, that is the best way to start the conversation. You know, show the passion behind why you support this, how this could have given you a voice as a child, you know, empowering, you know, get, giving that, that soft message that get, you know, gets across to these legislators of, wow, you're making that impact statement to them. Um, and then sharing um, that this law has been passed in 37 states, why not our state? And making sure to hit those, you know, main points. This is you know, not required things to be taught for six weeks like dare. You know, the eight ways of seeing older drugs. This is asking for, you know, two sessions, one session of, you know, teaching kids the eight ways on how to get away until today. And so I just really emphasize with people to write your legislators. And if you don't hear back, continue. Because for 10 years now, every about three to four months, those legislators I haven't heard from, I write them all back again. You know, hoping it'll catch one of their eye and there's always legislators, new ones coming into office, while other ones are going out. And I've noticed that when you see, you know, new ones come in, they get behind the importance of this bill. You know, I spent seven years trying to get this law passed in New York and it took getting the chair of the education committee out the door to finally get it done. And that's why I knew it would always get passed in that state because I knew it was just a matter of seeing some changes in is part of you know the legislation of people moving out and leaving office for you know new eyes to get on this bill and see the importance of it and um you know get it passed so that's you know that's what i tell people is to write your legislators and write them all you mentioned you know, your kids and getting that letter that Aaron's law is being taught to them uh what advice do you have for parents about how to protect their kids, uh, whether Aaron's Law is passed in their state or not, and just how to broach this really important topic to, to keep their kids safe. What I tell parents is, first and foremost, is to talk to your kids about it. Sit down and talk to them about safe and unsafe touch. Give them examples of safe secrets, grand surprise party, unsafe secrets, and you know, and you know, a lot of parents will come and say, I don't know how to start this conversation. And one of the easiest places I tell parents to, to open up the dialogue before you start talking, you know, about creating that safety list and, and those unsafe touches on, is the children's books. You know, I've got dozens of children's books on my website, aaronslaw.org, where parents can get those books right off Amazon and read them to their six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old, empowering them that this starts the conversation. So after finishing the book, you continue the dialogue. Now, four or five safe adults you can go to. You know, if something is happening to you. Because as I often mention, you know, it might be the dad, stepdad, and the child doesn't want to go tell mom. So who's five adults in your life that you can go to? You know, it's empowering parents to look for the grooming behavior. That person that wants to spend extra time, that suddenly is, you know, having more interest in your children than normal. You know, this, this somebody at the school wanting to help tutor more, suddenly more presence in their life. You know, the family member that is suddenly now taking your child on outings alone, let's go get ice cream, let's go for a boat ride, you know, let's do this, let's go on a picnic. 
looking for these red flags. Now, I don't want to make parents' alarms all go off and, you know, think every person out there is some predator, but you need to be prepared um, because you don't want to wake up one day and find out your 30-year-old who's addicted, you know, to heroin because of what happened when they were seven, eight, and nine, um, because you were oblivious, you know, that this was happening and you missed all the warning signs. So it's, it's getting parents to sit down and have those conversations. And, you know, something I really try to get across to parents as a big no, no for me is sleepovers. Sorry, but I wouldn't do them. My children will never have sleepovers. And, um, you know, yes, I had some sleepovers as I got older, you know, I was at 12, 13, 14 year old friends. That was a lot of fun, but as I like to tell parents, it's not worth the risk. Um, you know, Kids can go or play over at people's houses, but it's not worth the risk of something happening to your child in a home because I like to tell parents, how well do you really know little Susie's dad, stepdad? You might know mom really well from PTA and the other events, you know, the field trips you go on at school and, you know, the coffee dates you do, but dad, you know, he's working all the time. You don't know the situation for that and you're just going to let your little kid go spend the night there or someone you barely know. So I just really encourage parents to, you know, avoid those. I feel there's too much risk there. Erin, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us? No, I think we, I think we covered it all. You know, other than if, if parents have any questions for me, um, they can contact me from, through my website, erinslaw.org, you know, anything to, uh, you know, and there's also to follow the progress of what's going on with Aaron's Law, you can go to the Aaron's Law Facebook page um, to learn more there. All right, Aaron, we're cheering you on. 13 more states to go. Thank you so yep. much for all you do. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this and sharing it. survivor of child sexual abuse is working to pass a law requiring abuse prevention classes in all public schools. Studies reveal that one in four girls and one in six boys are sexually abused before the age of 18. Aaron's law, named after Aaron uh, Murrin, has passed in 36 states and it is pending now in 14 additional states. Actress Julie Anna Margulis has pushed lawmakers for years to pass the law in her home state of New York. Rena Ninen visited a school in Illinois to see how the classes teach kids about safe and unsafe touches. I think you shouldn't be afraid to talk about this to kids, what sexual abuse is and how to stop it and look out for it. It's hard to believe that this young group of fourth, fifth and sixth graders can speak about child sexual abuse with such to. candor. A lot of the times it goes unreported because people are scared. It could happen to my brother, it could happen to me. It can happen to my friends. It can be even like people you know and that you trust can do it. That's like scary. How many of you have heard about child sexual abuse? Just before sitting down with us, these students were taught a 50 minute child safety class. Do not touch me. Where they learned about how to prevent, recognize and respond to bullying, emotional and sexual abuse. What is it? that you think will stay with you after you leave the classroom? If someone tries to touch you in a place that you don't feel comfortable in, come tell me. You should tell an adult and don't be afraid to speak up. No blame, no shame. The program is in Waukegan, Illinois. It's part of a statewide mandate requiring students be taught personal body safety. It's known as Aaron's Law and is currently in 36 states. Kindergarten to 12th grade, we must spend an hour out of a school year teaching. Getting the law passed in those 14 pending states, including New York, is Erin Marin's mission. I will come back until this law is passed. And she's had a longtime support from actress Juliana Margulies. Erin Marin, Glamour Woman of the Year. I was once that six year old that woke up at the overnight at my best friend's house to her uncle sexually abusing me, telling me to keep it a secret. And so I didn't tell. I was frightened. I was terrified. She woke me up to a real epidemic. I was never sexually abused as a child. And I just, um, she kind of bowled me over. Only 20% of adult females and 5 to 10% of adult males recall a childhood sexual assault or sexual abuse incident and report it. I think there's so much shame attached to it. And it's this old ridiculous adage of, well, what were you wearing? Maybe you asked to be raped. That kind of attitude toward the fact that 
we might be physically a weaker sex and children are physically boys and girls weaker than adults. That doesn't mean anyone has the privilege to abuse that. What do you say to parents who say, I want it to be my decision how much and when and where I teach my kids about sexual abuse. I try to explain to parents this is personal body safety. This is teaching kids the difference between safe and unsafe touch, safe and unsafe secrets. Who are five safe adults you can go to if something is happening to you? You it's know, a self defense class. Yeah, a self defense that, class. That's how they should look at it. And what keeps me going is continuing to see these stories of another child disclosing that they have been abused immediately after being taught Aaron's law. That was the case with Lisa Jesse's daughter. It's not something that you ever expect your child to come home and say, well, this is what happened. She believes Aaron's law helped her daughter come forward when she was 10 years old. My daughter came home and just immediately told me I was inappropriately touched. This was your child's biological father. Correct. Where is he now? He's in prison. Uh, for the next 11 years. For people who say that this program is too controversial and shouldn't be taught in schools, what do you say? It's such a good thing for the kids to be comfortable because it gives them control. That's exactly what we witnessed with these kids. How many of you feel other schools in this country should have a course like this? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah, your feet too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, wow, out of the mouths of babes, right? Um, so, um, as you learned when I read Erin's bio, she has written three books about her personal story, um, her personal journey and healing. Um, but I want to share another fun fact with you, um, I, in case you don't know this. She has also written a book um, about her first cat, Bailey No Ordinary Cat, and she now has a cat uh, Carrot the Cat, who has become best friends with Ellen and has appeared on The Ellen Show. So there you go, a little fun fact about um, Aaron. Um, you know, we hope the two main takeaways from this webinar are one, that survivors can not only survive, but thrive. They can heal, they can do okay. And two, that prevention is critical. Aaron talked a lot about kids disclosing, and that's really important, but we also want to make sure that we're proactive and that we give kids the tools that they need to prevent abuse before it ever happens. That's our goal. And in Monique Burr Foundation, in our programs, um, we do that through teaching five safety rules, and you can see those on the screen there. Um, as you saw, MBF has partnered with Aaron um, to provide our programs as the means for implementing the mandates from Aaron's law in many states. And in the last video clip, the news story, which was filmed in New York uh, right before they became the 37th state to pass Aaron's law, we saw directly from kids how impactful MBF programs can be. So we really encourage you, if you're not using a prevention program or if your child's school is not using a prevention program that you change that today because this type of education is super important and it works. Um, this is where normally we would let you ask some questions of our live speakers and we will during the remainder of these um, webinars. But since Aaron is not here today, um, our outreach manager, Beth, as I said, has been monitoring questions. So Beth, do we have any questions? We don't have much time, but we do have a little bit of time. So have we had any questions? Uh, yes, I think the most popular question uh, continues to be federal funding. Um, how do they find out their individual states federal funding and that's been the most common one. If you okay. can address that. Okay, sure. So what Aaron was referencing was um, uh, Title 4A of the Every Student Succeeds Act it allocated to states on July 1st of 2017 and it provides $400 million um, nationally to, to states. The, the key to that is that states have the discretion as to how they use those funds. So Aaron's Law is one allowable way that states can use those funds. So really your State Department of Education is gonna be um, the place that you wanna go to find out how your particular state has allocated those funds and if funding for Aaron's Law is available to you. Um, I will say though also, 
um, we have a funding assistance guide that we have created. A lot of our facilitators of our programs write grants and um, we have a funding assistance guide available on our website that, we, that can give you language, can give you everything that you need to put together a grant and some other ideas about resources for funding. Um, very rarely do we have a facilitator that reaches out to us and says, you know, I want to use your programs, but we don't have the funding that um, very rarely do they, are they not able to find that funding. So don't let that stop you. Know that if you're interested in starting prevention, um, reach out to us and we, um, we will help you figure out a way to get the funding for the programs in your school or in your district or in your community. Okay, I think the next question is finding the language to approach their school boards, uh, child advocacy centers or any prevention organization outside of the schools. Right. Um, also, another very common request we get from facilitators, especially those in like child advocacy centers or other nonprofits that are serving kids is how do we partner with schools? How do we get this approved through the school board? Obviously, if your state has passed Aaron's law, it's much easier for you. If your state has not passed Aaron's law, then, you know, it's a it's a more challenging conversation. Um, again, we have a great resource. Um, on our website called Partnering with Schools. And it really walks you through step by step, you know, looking in your community as to what is already being done. Is there anybody else working in this space that you can collaborate with? You know, collaborate, we believe so strongly in collaborations and partnerships because we're all able to do so much more when we do that. Um, so uh, look for that resource and again, reach out to us. I just, we don't have much time for me to go into any detail right now, but we are certainly happy to share resources with you and even have jump on a phone call with you if you want to give us a call later. Um, anything else, Beth? Any other questions that we can kind of jump in quickly? We only have One time. One of the common questions, and you might include this in your wrap up, is some of the pushback we receive um, talking about such touchy subjects in prevention. Right. Um, yes, I mean, we do get that. And one thing that when we're out, when we're doing outreach and we're trying to market the program to schools and districts and is the one of the, the great things about MBF programs that I mentioned earlier, they're based on poly victimization. So they cover a broad range of topics. So if sexual abuse seems to be a touchy subject in your area, see what isn't maybe bullying isn't or maybe you know like florida we're everybody is talking about human trafficking prevention right now so um go in with those topics instead of the sexual abuse you'll cover the sexual abuse as a part of the curriculum but you know what we found early on in marketing this to florida because florida has not passed aaron's law um, we have a law that requires bullying prevention education. So that's how we get in. We say, you know, this program covers bullying and, you know, helps meet that mandate. And it meets a, a lot of other requirements as well as teaching kids about other types of victimization. So know your, your audience and what you need to play up when you're having those conversations for sure. Um, and I think since it's 128, I'll just wrap us up really quick. But again, reach out to us if you have any questions. Our contact information, will, um, I'll share that in just a minute. So um, as we end today, I just want to remind you, go to our website. As I mentioned, there are several resources. We also have um, free online professional development courses about child sexual abuse, about recognizing and reporting. Um, so, and you can also find more resources on aaronslaw.org. Um, we're going to send out an email um, after this uh, webinar sometime later this afternoon, and you'll receive a certificate of completion, a link to a certificate of completion, along with some resources. And one of those is a letter template to legislators from Aaron's um, website that she shared with us. And she, I know she has additional resources for educators, parents um, on her site. So we want to thank Erin, obviously, for sharing her story and her passion um, for protecting kids. What she's done is amazing. And um, we want to try to support her work as she gets those last 13 states on board. We'd also like to thank Clark for his time interviewing Erin. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, we really appreciate your time. Hope you learned something. Um, we look forward to, to talking with you further if you'd like to reach out to us. And of course, we hope you'll join us for the remainder of our Let's Talk About Prevention um, series. 
We're excited about our next um, speaker next Thursday, June 18th. It's um, Dr. Stan Sony from Emory University, and he will be presenting about adverse childhood experiences and why prevention must be a leading priority. And remember, he will be live, so you'll be able to ask him questions after his presentation. And I think he's planning on leaving a good chunk of time for, for that interactive Q&A experience. So if you haven't already registered for his session, be sure to do that so you don't miss that. So thank you again so much. We appreciate your time. Hopefully um, this Let's Talk About Prevention series will be a great experience for us and for you over throughout the summer. We are currently scheduled out through August 13th and if people like it, it's something we can look at continuing with additional topics that you may be interested in. So um, again, give us, in, reach out to us if you have any questions or feedback and we look forward to seeing you next week. So thank you very much from the whole MBF team.